What did the country's first black army general, first black federal judge, and first black cabinet secretary all have in common? Well, they graduated from Dunbar High School in Washington, D.C. And here to discuss her new book about the legendary institution is Allison Stewart, author of First Class, The Legacy of Dunbar, America's First Black Public High School. Wow. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for being interested. So what inspired you to write about Dunbar High School? My mom and dad went there. Oh, really? And okay. my grandfather as well. And my parents went there in the 40s, and my grandfather graduated in 1915. And, you know, I did the math, obviously. I knew it was segregated. It was mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. It was a segregated city. But they would tell me about all these illustrious graduates, people you mentioned, mm -hmm. and about these teachers they had who had PhDs and master's degrees and who were completely devoted to getting all of these kids an excellent education and getting them into college. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's an incredible story, and, and a lot of people don't know about it. I was working in D.C., well, working the news, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I said, hey, I'm going to go see Dunbar. And somebody said, oh, great football team. Mm. And that was it. And that was it. And of course, sports are important. I don't mm -hmm. want to downplay right. it. But I thought, wow, is this story going to get lost? Because the school mm. was so renowned for its academic legacy. Absolutely. And creating some of the country's most brilliant black minds. It's true. And, yeah. and it was against the tide at the time. I think mm. it's hard for all of us to realize that one of the reasons there was segregation is people thought blacks were socially, mentally, and intellectually inferior. So mm. you go to school over here. Mm -hmm. Well, the citizens of Washington, D.C. said, well, we are going to make the best school for our children, and they had to fight to keep it open. I mean, there was a, there was a principal who's a wonderful woman named Anna Julia Cooper, and everybody needs to look her up. Okay. Uh, she's a great fan. Anna Julia, Julia Cooper. Cooper. Okay. And in most neighborhoods, there's an Anna Julia Cooper circle or square somewhere, and she was this amazing principal. And at one point, they told her, well, you know, we want to trade out Shakespeare for Robinson Crusoe, because I, I don't think your students can understand wow. it. And she said, my scholars can do anything. And mm. she pushed back so much, she was ultimately fired Good and lost nice. her job. Well, do you think that was due to the times because of so many racial issues surrounding the popularity of the school being so successful, they had to get rid of the person who was making it happen? There was, that she wasn't falling in line. Mm -hmm. She wasn't, the white board of education took over the school system. For a long time, they ignored it and they said, okay, you guys run it over there. And then it was folded into the white board of education and they began to exert more power and, you know, southern congressmen were in charge of the funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the schools became really overcrowded and, you know, Dunbar was, I mean, if you look at the cover of the book, and I'm not doing this just to sell the book, no. I mean, they're packed in there, right? Yeah. yeah. And the blackboard is broken, but there's obviously learning going on. So they weren't going to let anybody, anybody get in their way. That The motto of the school is keep a plug in a way, which is a Paul Lawrence Dunbar poem, mm -hmm. and that's who the school's named after. Right. Well, talk to us about some of the highly successful people that have graduated from the school. Oh, unbelievable. Senator Edward Brooke, who was the first popularly elected black senator, mm -hmm. and he's still alive. I actually got to talk to him. He's in his 90s. Wow. And he's an amazing, amazing man. He was, he was elected in the 60s. First black federal judge, Bob Weaver, the first black cabinet member. Wesley Brown, first black graduate of the Naval Academy. He was unbelievable. He was a brilliant guy, and he would get all these demerits for no reason, no reason. Mm -hmm. no, we know the uh, reason. Right, right, right. Somebody yeah. walked up to him and said, you know what, I heard a rumor the NAACP is paying you to be here and I'm gonna make you earn your money every day. Wow. Mm -hmm. But he told me this great story about an upperclassman who was really nice to him. Mm -hmm. And this was funny the way he said, he said, yeah, he was a really nice guy. His name was Jimmy, Jimmy Carter. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, by the way. Jimmy Carter, yeah. yeah. And I talked to President Carter. I got to President Carter to wow. interview him for the book and he remembered how brave Wesley Brown was. And uh, so it's talking to these people, hearing their stories. Mm -hmm. You know, you think you're having a bad day, you're, you know, you're cranky because yeah. there's a long line at Pinkberry. Mm -hmm. and, then you think, <laughs> and then you think you about what what's happening through. and what they wow. went through and what they fought for to get this education. So we could be here having this conversation now. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Well, talk to us a little bit about the research yeah. involved in it. How did you get all of these people that you mentioned to sign on to the project? They were very happy to talk about it. So many people were so happy that somebody was interested in telling Dunbar's story. And I have to say, I talked to a lot of people who weren't bold-faced names. One of the things Dunbar did is it created a really strong black middle class in Washington and in the country, and a lot of teachers and a lot of educators. And they were just happy to be able to tell their story. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It took a simple letter. I became a very good letter writer because they're people, you know, it's, they're sort of formal. The DC is still a little bit Southern. No, yes. So I write an introductory letter. I'd follow up, I'd go to their house, they'd make me lunch, 
We got pound cake. Mm -hmm. Ate a lot of pound cake. Yeah. <laughs> I had to do a lot of extra time on the treadmill. Tea. Some ice, some sweet tea. <laughs> some sweet tea. <laughs> exactly. Well, you talked about the evolution of the school, but yeah. let's go into it a little more because yeah. it went from being this bastion of the black academic elite to a school that was in utter disrepair. What happened? Yeah, it's a really sad story. Um, it's got a little bit of a hopeful ending. Um, you know, it was a magnet school, mm -hmm. basically, because it's hard to think, knowing D.C., that there were only three or four high schools that blacks could even go to mm -hmm. if you were lucky enough to be able to go to high school. Many people had to work. Some people came up from the South and didn't have enough education to get to high school. So when D.C., I always say it legally desegregated because we all know it didn't mm -hmm. integrate because there was yeah. all housing discrimination mm -hmm. and everything else, um, D it became a neighborhood school. And it held on, it tried to hold on for a long time. There was always a corner of it that just tried to hold on to that spirit. Mm -hmm. But the problems of D.C. became the problems of Dunbar, like, like all inner city schools. Mm -hmm. You know, D.C. had financial problems in the 70s, yeah, and drug after problems in the 80s. Yeah, and so riots, it really the, became yeah. difficult. And there were educators who were trying so hard, but you can try all you want, but if you don't have a healthy neighborhood around and a healthy mm. city, you don't have a healthy public school system. That's wow. true. Well, they're actually getting a lot of money now because yeah. it was first built in 1916, then rebuilt in 1977, and recently they were received a $100 million renovation grant. Mm. Oh. So what changes can we see now, and do you think it will bring back to its original status of excellence? Mm -hmm. I think it's it's never going to get to be what it was, mm -hmm. but it can mm -hmm. be its own thing. That's sort of my mm -hmm. whole thing, is that I, I, I kind of hope it's going to be the first organically integrated school because it's in a neighborhood that's gentrifying, but people are staying. Okay. And the other thing is, when they tore down the original Dunbar, they took a lot of the history with it. And that's what I was talking about, being the history disappearing. So they've actually built the history into this high school. It's a $122 million high school. They have plaques all on the floor with the names of those illustrious graduates so the kids see them every day. Mm -hmm. And they've led, left some of the plaques blank to say to the kids, you could be, oh, you could be that person. That's they great. have the, they that's have the eight, yeah. eight postage stamps. There are Dunbar graduates and teachers on eight wow. US postage stamps. And they're on a wall this big in the media center looking down on the kids. Wow. So they're really looking to the past for inspiration for the future. That's great. And is that what you hope readers take away from this book, being able to look at the past and be inspired about how we can better the future? I think so, and mm -hmm. also the idea of we're talking about education reform a lot, mm -hmm. and I remember being, being in D.C. and saying to somebody, you know you have a model eight blocks away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, really, really doing the forensics and the history of why the schools got to where they are so that we can figure out how to fix them. Mm -hmm. And I think it, looking at a school like Dunbar can be really informative for teachers and educators and reformers. I hope. That's mm -hmm. my hope, hope. What's the main solution you found out of researching the, the school and seeing their templates for success that other people can yeah. use to improve in their schools? I think it's the human capital. Mm -hmm. I think it's mm -hmm. valuing teachers and getting career teachers, people who mm -hmm. this is what they want to do. And Because I think teaching really is a skill mm -hmm. and a talent. And I think that we overlook that a lot, and I think we really need to value teachers more, and also value the community being involved in the school, yes. yeah. surrounding the school, protecting the school, the way the people did before. I mean, they used to call it, a, as Senator Ray Brooks said, it was a cocoon. They put a cocoon around us mm -hmm. so we wouldn't get infected with the racism of the outside world, so we could wow. grow to be who we wanted to be, and then we went out into that world, we knew who we are, mm -hmm. confident. and we were confident, mm -hmm. and, we, and they mm -hmm. were armed with excellence. They couldn't be wow. denied. That's awesome. So you've been a successful journalist for nearly oh. two decades. Yeah. You've worked at every place from M MTV to MSNBC. Yeah. My goodness. How'd you get into journalism? I'm curious. Oh, I was in college, mm -hmm. and I went to the college radio station. I went to my dorm the first day and my college radio station the second day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I went to Brown, which has a really awesome yes. radio station. Mm -hmm. And I just fell in love with the idea of communicating with people. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I worked there hour after hour. My dad used to call it the most expensive Votech program he'd ever <laughs> seen. <laughs> and then a lot of, yeah, a lot of people from Brown went into, went into media and I, you know, you all know, it's who you know. That's it how is. you find out about jobs. And I started out at MTV as the assistant to all the VJs. Mm -hmm. You're kidding. Which meant putting like downtown Julie Brown's wigs in her dressing room Whoa. and calling cars and, and Kurt Loder. waking up Adam wow. Sandler because he was supposed to be a guest VJ. <laughs> wow. So, and I just worked my way up. I mean, wow. really, I just scrapped my way up from a PA at a floor producer to AP to 
I said, you know, if I put on some makeup, maybe I can do this on TV. And wow. you did That's it. how it started. You did very well. Downtown no. Julie Brown. Wow, now that took that's me back. back. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're telling on yourself. Yeah, she was a baby. Uh, yeah, a baby. Baby. So then what's next for you, baby? <laughs> um, I would really love, I've been saying this, I would love for this to be made into some sort of narrative drama, oh. like a Boardwalk oh. Empire or a Downton Abbey, you know, maybe in the 40s, mm -hmm. sort of as the nascent struggle for the civil rights movement. Because I'd love to put every black actor in Hollywood to work. That right. would be great. I think that would be so great. So that's something I'm really looking forward to. And um, I'm hoping to write a kid's book, and I'm hoping, and I'm, I'm fun employed, so once the book tour's over, I'm going to get a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you can write the script for your new series. Maybe, maybe so. All maybe right. a new career. HBO may be on the phone oh, soon. No. You don't know. Well, when it comes out, you'll come back and release it here, right? Oh, you know it. For <laughs> okay. sure. For Great. sure. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. All right, you're watching Arise Entertainment 360.